was such a weak whoop, whoop, whoop. It was like a non-existent whoop, whoop. Okay, so we're studying the Gospel of John, guys, and um, we have been studying chapter 5, which happens during the second year of Jesus' ministry. Now, we're going to fast forward because chapter 6 takes us to the beginning of the third year of Jesus' ministry. John is really good about giving us points of time, and this happens near Passover, so it's the beginning of of the third year of Jesus' ministry. Remember, John is not trying to tell you everything he remembers. He's not trying to tell you everything he knows. What he, what he wants you to, to understand is that Jesus is the Messiah. And that by believing Jesus is the Messiah, you'll have life in his name. Okay, so that, that's why he's, he's skipping like this. But uh, today we're going to see two big miracles from the scripture. We're going to see where... Um, Jesus feeds the 20,000. Now, I know you, you call it something else. Uh, you call it the feeding of the, you, you, you call it the feeding of the 5,000, but that's only the men. What's up with that? So, so, so it, it, it's the feeding of the, the, the 20,000, and then, then um, uh, he's going to walk on water. Jesus walks on water. Uh, the, the feeding of the 20,000 is the only miracle that happens uh, in all four gospels that, that is reported in all four gospels outside of resurrection. Okay, so th- this, this whole thing that we're talking about today, is a, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, I, I want you guys to see from chapter six, we, we won't cover all of this this morning, but just big picture, I want you to see that Jesus feeds 20,000 people and they get so Excited about that. I mean, they are so into the fact that out of nothing, Jesus feeds all of these people that they say, we want to make this guy king. We want him to be king. And Jesus' response to their desire to make him king causes them to reject Jesus. The people of Galilee reject Jesus from this point on. So, so uh, if you're following along in the study of John with us, here's what I want you to see. Chapters 2 through 4 of the, of the book of John take us from sign faith to word faith. Chapter 5, the rejection of the Jewish leaders. Chapter 6, the rejection of the people of Galilee. It's the beginning of the end. Chapters 5 and 6, back to back, these two rejections Mark the beginning of the end of Jesus' ministry. All right. So that, that's kind of an overall overarching picture of where we are in this, in this study. Now, let's talk about tw- feeding 20,000 people. I, I've done some big banquets before in my life. Nothing close to 20,000 people. I want you to think about the um, State Farm Arena, formerly owned as the Phillips Arena, right? The State Farm Arena. 20,000 people, no concessions, nothing. He, there, there's, no, there's no Walmart. There's no Costco, right? There, there's no Kroger. There, there's no fast food joints. There's not even a dime to spend on the, the food. And yet Jesus is going to be able to feed 20,000 people. Jesus has no anxiety around feeding 20,000 people. He has, he has no, no qualms with being able to do that at all. But the disciples can't even imagine feeding all of these people. They, they can't even consider it as a possibility, which brings me to the big idea that I have for you guys this morning. We receive unlimited possibilities when we walk with Jesus. There are unlimited possibilities for your life when you walk with Jesus Christ. Now, listen, if I had the opportunity to sit down and talk with each of you this morning, just the two of us, and ask you, what are the lids in your life? Lids. Uh, Will you guys say lids? The lids in your life. Okay, where are your self-imposed no's? 
that, that knows that you are ready to give. Okay, I, I'm not talking about, I, I've prayed about this and, and Jesus is telling me, I, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't think the Lord wants me to do that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you're sitting on a no. What are those? What, what are the things, like, let's say, for example, someone in your life, maybe yourself, there, there's some kind of big miracle that needs to take place in your life, but, but you're unwilling to go to the Lord and pray about it because it seems so big to you, so insurmountable to you that you're not even praying about it. That's a self-imposed no. See, the, uh, maybe, maybe it's a job opportunity. Maybe it's a, a, a new business that, that opens up to you. But, but you, you've already determined, I, I, I'm not built for that. I can't do that. I, I can't enter into that. It's a lid in your life. It's a self-imposed no. Maybe it's because of fear. Maybe some other issue in your life, something that's driving the bus. A lid in your life, you're not considering bringing it to the Lord, you know your answer is already no. It's a lid. Uh, maybe it's a ministry opportunity right here at church. Maybe it's, maybe it's to go on a missions trip. Well, I don't know what I would have to offer anybody on a missions trip. So you don't pray about it. You don't ask the Lord anything about it because you can't imagine the possibility, just like the disciples today, you can't imagine the possibility that you would have anything to offer so you have a self-imposed, no, that's a lid. That's a lid in your life. With Jesus, there are unlimited possibilities. Guys, Jesus loves to do the impossible. He absolutely loves it. And we as believers don't often lean into this idea. We lean into what's possible instead of leaning into what is impossible. We've got to start taking the lids off of our lives. And I think that's what you're going to see this morning as we work our way through These two major, major stories this morning. John chapter six, beginning with verse one, it says, after this, now I told you that's a long after this, probably almost a year. So so just to give you an idea, if, 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 we don't know this for sure, but if in John chapter five, if the feast of John chapter five is the Passover, then that that Jesus attending down in Jerusalem, then you see, guys, it, now the Passover, and we're going to get to this in a minute, but the, the, this is the time of the Passover here in John 6. So it's about a year later if, if that's the Passover feast in John 5. So he's skipping a lot of stuff here. After this, so, so, so here's, let, let me just kind of catch you up with the other gospels. So, so we know that the disciples have been out ministering in groups of two. Jesus sent them out throughout Galilee to minister in groups of two and they were supposed to heal the sick, cleanse the lab or cast demons out. They, they were supposed to preach the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God and they were around traveling. So it's been a long time at this point since Jesus has spent any time with his disciples. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, because every place in the Bible has... Mm-hmm. Every place in the Bible has two names. All right, so same seat. Now, now guys, look. I, I, I just want to provide you so, some visual for this, for some context for this. The Sea of Galilee, I I, I looked it up. It is 8.1 miles wide. 8.1 miles wide. So we know from the other gospels, they actually get in a boat and sail across the Sea of Galilee. Luke also tells us that they are, they're getting away from the crowds of Capernaum and they're headed to a place where they can just hang out. Jesus can catch up with his disciples. Hey, what's been going on with you guys? Teach them. He just wants to spend some time 
with his boys, right? He wants to get the band back together, right? So, so, so Jesus is heading with them away from the crowds across the Sea of Galilee in a rowboat. They're in a rowboat. And again, you, you, you'll, you'll see that as we move through the scripture as well. And, and a large crowd, a, lo- a lo- large crowd. Okay, we're, we're, we're talking about 20,000 people and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Okay, now, now, now guys, here's the thing. Jesus is getting in the boat, but there are not boats for everybody. So the way they're going to have to follow Jesus is to go around, to walk. So, so Jesus and his disciples get in a boat and they go straight across like this. The crowds that have been following him, they go around. They have to walk around the sea. All right. Now, now, so so you can see how that Jesus and his disciples would have beat the the crowd across because they're going straight, and these people have to go all the way around, right? So uh, Jesus went up on the mountain. I want you guys to notice this. Jesus went up on the mountain. Uh, Matthew also uses this term. Mark also uses this term. It doesn't say Jesus went up on a mountain. It says he went up on the mountain. So uh, this is the way I think about this. There's a place in my hometown. I've talked about it before. There's a place in my hometown, Brevard, North Carolina, little mountain town, beautiful little mountain town. It, it, um, there's a place there called Pretty Place. Now, if you went there, you would say, well, every place there is a pretty place, right? Because it's gorgeous there. But among locals there, there's a place that we know that's called Pretty Place, right? Uh, you can Google it, Pretty Place, Brevard, North Carolina. Okay, so, so, so look, here, here's, here's the thing. It seems like that just, we're not told this explicitly in the Gospels, but it seems the way John uses this term and the way that Matthew and Mark uses this term, it seems like that maybe among the locals there in this region that there was a place that everybody knew there called the mountain. It wasn't just a random mountain. It was the mountain. Probably a place people were used to going kind of as a retreat there. And there he sat down with his disciples. Now, why is that important? Because it it probably tells you why that large crowd of people was actually able to find exactly where Jesus was when when they went around. And and he was going across on the boat. And they're coming around because it's probably a very well-known place, the mountain. Now, the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Now, guys, next Sunday, Pastor Pete's speaking for you guys next week, and he's going to talk to you about how Jesus calls himself the bread of life and how this all connects to how he's going to feed all of them today, right? And, and, it, and it's, going to connect to, it's going to connect to the whole Passover thing. The fact that it's the Passover feast is really going to be a big deal as we move through this chapter. But I want you to see the Passover feast in a little bit different light with our story today. D.A. Carson said this. He said the Passover feast was to, the, was to Palestinian Jews what the 4th of July is to Americans, or better, what the anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne is to Loyalist Protestants in Northern Ireland. It was a rallying point for intense nationalistic zeal. This goes some way to explaining their fervor that tried to force Jesus to become king. Here's what I'm telling you. They love being Jews. They love being Jewish. I I, I told you guys about it on Easter. These were some prejudiced people. And man, when it was Passover time and they were celebrating the fact that the Egyptians slammed into the sea and we became victorious, woo! Woo! Right? They love that. They got excited about that. And now here's this opportunity that, that we're going to see today where they think they're going to make Jesus their king. And Passover really plays into this whole thing that's happening here. Now, Jesus gets to the mountain. He gets there. He gets up on the some side of the mountain a little bit with his, with his boys. And, and, and listen, listen, it, this is not like a Georgia mountain. This is not a forest. Okay, not a lot of trees here, kind of barren. So, so lifting up his eyes then, 
and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him. Now, guys, this is the only gospel. John is the only gospel that tells us about this conversation that happens early in the day. Seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, note takers, Philip, uh, uh, make this note. John chapter 1, verse 44. John chapter 1, verse 44. Now, Jesus said to Philip. So, so guys, Philip is from this area. It, it tells us in John 1, that he's from Bethsaida, this area where the mountain is. This whole area is called Bethsaida. Right, So it makes sense that Jesus would ask Philip this question because Philip's from around here, right? So so it'd be like you you go to somebody's hometown, you you ask them a question about what's around, right? So, So Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Hey, what what's around here? What's a good place to eat? Where can we buy some food around here? Now, 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 guys, I want you to notice this because the other gospels report the conversation they have later in the day, and we'll get to that. But I want you to notice that in John, he tells us about the conversation that happens between him and Philip before the crowds even arrive. Jesus is standing on the side of the mountain. He's looking out at the crowd's coming towards them, mass of people coming around the sea. He looks at Philip, hey, where's a good place to buy some food for all these people that are coming up here? Here's what we are going to learn today from Philip, guys. Jesus commands us to do more than we are able because he wants to work through us. Do you guys see that he asks him already? that The the crowd is not even there yet. He's seeing the crowd come towards them. And and he says, where where are we to buy bread? He he knows there's nowhere to buy bread around there for 20,000 people. But guys, Jesus loves the impossible. He he loves to stoke that fire to say, look, this is impossible. I just want to point this out to you. Before they even arrive here, this is going to be impossible. Absolutely going to be something you think you can't do. Where we buy bread so that these people can eat. And, And he, this is, Jesus, he said this to test him for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus already knew he was going to feed them. Standing there, watching the people come towards him. Jesus already knows. I'm going to feed these people. But, but here's how we evaluate, guys. We don't evaluate the way Jesus does. Jesus wants the impossible so that he can work through us. Not how we evaluate. Even as believers, here's the way we think about things. We evaluate based on what we think is possible for us, our skill set, our talents, our gifts, our abilities, our fears, our anxieties. Uh, we, We analyze that and we analyze the situation. We analyze the circumstance. What's going on with this thing, right? How, how difficult is this thing that, that, that has this, this possibility or, or impossibility? That we, we evaluate based on these things. Instead, guys, here, here's the thing. You're going to see this as we move on. They don't even ask Jesus what he wants to do. And neither do we. We don't ask Jesus. Jesus, do you want me To step out into the impossible? Is that what you're asking me to do? Because, guys, I'm telling you, Jesus, uh, he loves the impossible. He wants you to step out. Not, not, Not all the time. The problem is we don't ask him when it's impossible. Because we evaluate based on the circumstance and ourselves. A lot of times... He's going to say, I want you to do it because it's impossible. Here's what we learn from Philip again. Jesus has approaches that you haven't considered. 
Jesus has approaches to the impossible that you haven't even considered. You, you, you haven't even thought about them. Here's, here's, what, here's what Philip answered. Philip answered him, 200 denarii. Okay, guys, a denarii was a little silver Roman coin. Okay, you, in, during this time period, you got one denarii for every day work that you did, right? You, you did a hard day's labor, whatever it is, working out in the field, working for someone. End of the day, flip you one of those denarii. Thank you, great day, you know. So 200 denarii would be roughly one year's worth of work, roughly. I think there were 261 work days for us last year. Right, So basically a year's salary for someone, for a common laborer. 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. Now guys, did Jesus ask him, ask him if there was enough money to buy bread? Is that what Jesus asked? What did Jesus ask? He asked, where? Where can we buy bread? Philip answers, By saying, it doesn't even matter where. Because even if we knew where to go, we don't have a dime. It would take at least 200 denarii to give everybody just a little bit. And and guys, here's the thing again. do, Do you notice he never looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, what would you have me do? Jesus, how would you want me to approach this situation? How how would you want me to handle this? He never asked Jesus this. He's evaluating just based on the fact that he knows how to normally buy some bread. And and, and guys, this is often, I I see Christians do this so many times. Guys, do you you understand that you serve the creator? Do, Do you understand that Jesus sits on a throne. He is, he is the creator God. D- d- look, I, I, I can get so frustrated sometimes with Christians because why, why is it that, that Elon Musk is more creative than we are? Why is that? That's not right. We, we serve the creator God. Here's the problem is that we come up against a wall in our lives And we decide, oh, it must not be God's will for us to do that. Oh, well, it was impossible and now I'm facing this wall. So I guess, you know, I guess this is the end of it for me. I guess this this is the end of it for us. Have you ever considered that Jesus may want you to face that wall in order for you to do something with that wall that no one else has considered before? We, we, we come up against these what seems to be impossible situations and we throw up in our hands and go, oh, that must have been God's will. Hey, here's, here's what I see, hear people do. They'll say, well, well, just go home and pray about it. Just go home and pray about it. And so this is what people do. This is what believers do. I, I, I'm talking about believers. This is what we do. We go home and we say, oh God, Change this situation. Change this circumstance. You you told us to try this and so we're stepping out by faith and we're trying it, but we're running into this wall and we need you to change this wall. And then the wall doesn't change and you go, okay, I prayed about it. Well then, pastor, what am I supposed to do? Jesus, help me figure out what to do with this wall. You told me to step up by faith and try this. How do I face this wall? Do you want me to learn how to tunnel? Do you want me to figure out how to go under a wall? Do you want me to figure out how to make a ladder? How how to make a ladder that will support all the people that need to get across this wall? Jesus, is there a drill that you want me to develop that can drill through this wall? Is Jesus, is there a way around this wall in my, that I haven't even thought about. Listen, among the church leadership here, we call those things third options. Third options. Jesus, I need a clever device. I need a third option. Guys, in this story today, Jesus has a third option. 
He's gonna, he's got a way that none of them could have even considered. But we serve a God who has those kind of solutions. You serve a God who has those sorts of solutions. Your wall does not mean stop. I just just want you to think about that for a second. Okay. So so now we're going to fast forward. So now we're going to fast forward and catch up with the conversation that's happening later in the day with the other gospels, okay? And here's what we're going to learn. We're going to learn from the boy that God can take what may appear to be a small offering and he will multiply. God can take what may appear to be a small offering and he will multiply it. Let's look at verse eight. This is his interaction with Andrew. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, there is a boy. So John is the only gospel who tells us it's a boy. It's a boy. There is a boy here who has five barley loaves. John is the only gospel that tells us it's barley loaves. A cheapy kind of bread in this time period. Uh, you know, this is not quite apples to apples, but just maybe in the way we would think about things today, uh, maybe it would be closer to the way we would think of a saltine cracker. Okay, just a cheapy kind of... Uh, uh, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. And, and guys, s- scholars say this is not like a piece of trout. Okay, th- this would have been like... This would have been, this is the term I've seen scholars use, pickled fish. Pickled fish. So maybe closer to like a sardine. What, what you would get like with a, an, a, out of a sardine can. Okay, so this is, the, this is the little sack lunch that the little boy has on this day. There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. Now, now guys, look, I, I think this means something. I think it means that the disciples have been looking for food. It it seems to me that they're going around into the crowd, looking around who has food here. What what could we do to feed all of these people? And Andrew yells out, hey, there's a little boy over here. He's got a little sack lunch. Guys, can you see Peter react to that? What are you saying? That that is not helpful. Right? And he says, but what are they, what are they for so many? Right. How is that going to help us? Again, guys, anybody asking Jesus, Jesus, what do you want to do? Jesus, how do you want to work through me? Jesus, how do you want to solve this? Jesus, how how come you've led me here right now? Jesus, what what do you have in this? Nobody's asking. Look in verse 10. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, there there was much grass in the place. Now, that doesn't mean weed. Okay, look. Have the people sit down. Some of y'all laughed way too hard at that. Listen. <laughs> Have the people sit down. Okay, so, so guys, this is how this translates in our culture. Okay, it translates like, you guys come to the dining room table. All right, that, that, that's how it kind of translates for us. Have the people sit down. It, because it, it, it's dinner time. It's dinner time. So he's not saying, hey guys, I've got something to feed you. He's not saying that. But it's like saying, come to the dining room table. It implies something. And look, look for your note, note takers. Uh, Mark chapter 6 and verse 40. Mark chapter 6 and verse 40. It tells us that Jesus had them sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Hundreds and fifties. 
So, so I want you to think about 20,000 people and they're, they're sitting down in this grassy area and there's 400 sets of 50 people sitting out there. They're, they're, all, they're all seated down in this big grassy area. Jesus kind of up on the mountain and he's looking out at all of these sets of 50 out there. Now, now guys, I can imagine this being a very awkward situation right now because he has sat us down like he's going to feed us. I imagine the people, because of the disciples asking around, I imagine the people looking around going, what's happening right now? Has to feel kind of awkward. There's no food. We know there's no food. We know there's no food truck showing up. You know, Chick-fil-A is not catering this event. Why did he have us sit down? It had to feel pretty awkward. Guys, can you imagine the disciples? Because again, they haven't asked Jesus. So can you imagine how awkward this is for them right now? What in the world is he doing? We do not have a bite of food. Why is he having them sit down like this in this field? So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Okay, note takers, note takers. Matthew chapter 14, verse 21. Matthew chapter 14, verse 21. It says that there were 5,000 men besides the women and children. It's very clear. 5,000 men besides the women and children. So there were 20,000 people there that day. All right, so... When the men sat down about 5,000. It's talking about men here, okay? Bunch of, bunch of people. Verse 11. So Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish. Okay, so, so Jesus takes the food in his hands, and he blesses it, and he starts giving it out. Now, now guys, this is the way it works in my head. John doesn't tell us how the miracle is done, but it it kind of feels a little bit to me like the water into wine where he's kind of, you know, he's he's not putting a big display on here. He's not going, ha-ha, more food. Ha-ha. You know, he's just, he's just, so it seems to me that what's going on here is that every time he puts his hands back in the basket, there's more food there. There, There's more bread and there's more fish there. And he pulls that out and and he he gives it to the people seated. And then he goes back, he puts his hands back. And and I I can imagine, guys, can you imagine the second time he pulled out food? Right? The, the, The first time he pulls it out, okay. Yeah, that's it. That's all we got. And then he reaches back in the second time and they watch him pull out food. Can you imagine how, if you were disciples standing there watching what's going on, what is happening right now? I mean, probably, probably they're thinking about the widow's oil. Uh, Elijah in the Old Testament, they're watching Jesus do that. They're probably thinking about a miracle very similar that, that Elijah had in the Old Testament. And, and they're watching Jesus pull this food out and Jesus just keeps. I mean, guys, can you imagine how worn out Jesus would have had to have been? This is, this is like over 20,000 times. You'll see what I mean when I say over. In, in, in a minute. Over 20,000 times he does like this. And he's just handing out food. And he's handing out food and he's handing out food as much as they wanted. It wasn't just one little set of food for, it was as much as you wanted to eat. It was a buffet for 20,000 people. Now, now guys, I I want you to think about the little boy with me for just a moment. Think about the little boy. Eight, nine years old. When they came, and yelled in front of everybody and said, we have this little boy's lunch. 
What do you think went through that little boy's mind? Does he want to give it away? But he selflessly gives. And his selflessly giving, his selfless giving means that I'm still telling his story today. And guys, that applies to all of us. Your selfless giving makes an impact on future generations. God can take that small offering of whatever and he can multiply it. Now, now hear me, church, hear me. What do you have to give? You have time, talent, and treasure. The three things that you can give are time, talent, and treasure. In this day and age, the time period that we're in now, it's easier to give money than it is to give time. It is a greater sacrifice for you to give your time than it is for you to give your money. I want to challenge you that if you serve with your time, that Jesus will multiply it. The years the locust has destroyed it's not just the money. We often think about giving it shall be given to you. Press down, chicken together, run it over. Ah, woo, glory to God, right? Money. It's not just your money. It's your time as well. Your time, your talent, your treasure. I want to, I want to talk about one other person one other person that, that's implied, I think, in this story that, that, that doesn't show up here. I, I, I want to talk about, guys, I, I want to talk about the mom who made that little boy's lunch that day. I want to talk about the mom who got up early that morning and knew the little boy was going to be gone all day. So she made him a little lunch and, and put the, the barley loaves that she had made and, and the little fish in that basket and sent him with it. That mundane act that she did probably every single day to send off with that little boy. I'm still telling her story today. Look, I, I want to talk to you parents you guys who are busting it, getting up early, making your kids lunches, doing the dishes, doing the laundry. And sometimes it can feel like, what am I doing all this for? What, why am I killing it just to keep this house clean? Why, what's going on? Listen, I, I, I want to tell you, those mon seemingly mundane acts that you are doing are creating a legacy for your children that is more powerful than you could ever imagine. Oh, come on, if you're going to clap, let's clap. I'm still talking about the mom that made the meal for this little boy today. You've got a legacy. Parent, believer, you've got a legacy that you're dealing with there. Believe for great things. Believe for great things. Oh, I, I can't, I can't. All right, let's go. We, we learn from the disciples, when you serve, you'll gain more than anyone. When you serve, when, when you serve, you gain more than anybody. You, you get more out of it than anybody. Let's look at verse 12. And when they had eaten their fill, oh, I'm just as full as a pick on a big fat dog. Woo! That's as much barley loaves and pickled fish I ever want to eat again. They get back home and see somebody eating that. Ooh, that don't, don't even show me that. Ooh. Oh, my goodness. Oh. oh. He told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments. So, guys, I had an aunt. I had a great aunt that when you went to her house and ate, 
After, we, after you're done eating, she would go around off your plate and pick the leftover bread that you had eaten off of. And she would freeze it in the freezer and make dressing out of it. My mom said, you are never eating her food. When she would bring like potluck meals to church, y'all are scared of potluck meals now. When she would bring potluck meals to church, when we would walk in the door, my mom would be standing there. Here's the dishes you do not eat. Gather up the leftover fragments. So I'm thinking this is not like what Joe had eaten off of. That nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Uh, 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 enough for, for all of the disciples to, to have enough. You know, you, you know for, for each, a basket for each disciple. So, so, so listen, guys, I, we, when we used to go to Haiti, one of the things that we always came back home saying was, man, we feel like we got so much more than we gave. When you serve, when you have the opportunity to give of yourself, can you imagine? Here's these disciples. They've been out healing sick, cleansing leper. They, they've been out preaching the gospel. And now here they are serving the baskets of barley loaves and fish. But they end up with so much more than they could have bargained for. Because when you serve, when you give, it means, look, I, I, I know some of you are like, well, I, all I do when I go back there with the kids, all I do is hold babies. That's all I do. That's, that, that's the ministry of presence. That, that's you getting to have an opportunity to, to hold that child and, and to be a, a, a face, a smiling face to that mom that lets that mom come in here and, and, and be ministered to. For, for this time, the, the, what you're investing in them is so much more than, 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 than what you're producing. It's so much more that you're, we're getting out of it. I want you to think about how you serve and what God is doing in and through you when you serve. And here's what we learn from the crowds. We learn that well, from the disciples. When you, oh, that's not it. I guess my button didn't work right. We learned from the crowds, Jesus has bigger plans than you imagine. Jesus has bigger plans than you imagine. Look at verse 12. What, what is it doing? When the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, the sign, when, when they saw the sign. Okay, now guys, if you're following along in the study with us, you'll notice that John is not numbering them anymore. He stopped with number two. But, but the people saw the sign. I, I believe this is one of the seven signs of John, the feeding of the, the 20,000. They said, this indeed, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. All okay, right, note takers, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Deuteronomy 18, 15. That's the prophecy that, that talked about the prophet who is to come. So this is very messianic. So Jesus has just fed these 20,000 people. And they're like, wow, this has got to be the prophet that was, that's to come into the world. They're starting to have that conversation among themselves out there, right? Verse 15. Uh, Guys, this is not included in the other Gospels. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. All right, right now, guys, look. I want you to notice they are not coming by force to make him king. That's not what's happening. Jesus perceives that they were about to come and take him by force. So they're not coming Jesus gets, this is about to happen, right? Now, now guys, here's, here's what I want you to see, is that the crowds, the crowds want Jesus. We don't care about you being Messiah so much. We, we definitely want you to feed us all the time. We need you feeding us and healing us. 
<laughs> I never thought about it like that before. We need you feeding us and healing us. And so Jesus gets, they're going to try to make it. They're, what they want is to oust Herod, put Jesus in. Herod out, Jesus in. That's what they want. Guys, they can't imagine what Jesus has in plan, in store. They cannot understand. Jesus doesn't want to be Herod's replacement. Jesus doesn't want to be the king. Jesus wants to be the king of kings. He, he wants to be the Lord of lords. He wants to be king of it all. They, they don't get this. They don't grasp what's going on here. Guys, often when you bring something to Jesus and he says no to it, it's because he has something bigger in store in the future that you can't imagine. You, you can't look at that no from Jesus as being something he's a limiting you to. It's because there's something greater out there that is to come that you haven't even thought of yet. withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, now, now guys, look, we, we don't know a lot about this. We don't, don't know a lot about what's... John doesn't tell us a lot of details here. I, man, when we get to heaven, I have so much about this story I want to know. Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So Jesus goes up further into the mountain. Here's the crowd of people. Jesus pulls back. When the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. We know from the other gospels, Jesus actually sent the disciples down to get in the boat and go back across the water. Jesus doesn't go with them because he perceives the crowd's gonna try to make him king. So they, he doesn't pass through the crowds for them to take him. He withdraws. It's getting late. He sends the disciples down, sends them back on the boat. You guys with me? They got into the boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. Guys in Greek, this kind of sounds like this. Darkness had come to them, but Jesus had not yet come to them. Darkness had come, but Jesus had not come. Here's what we learned from Jesus' interaction with the disciples. Don't allow fear to create those lids in your life. Don't allow fear to keep you from where God wants you to go. Don't let fear keep you from facing those walls in your life. Verse 18, the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Now, now guys, I want you to see that little rowboat. They're rowing in it. All of those disciples in a boat rowing. And it's going up and down now. Here comes the waves. Here comes the waves. The strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles. Guys, they are halfway. Sea of Galilee is how long? How wide? 8.1, yes. They are three or four miles across right out there in the middle rowing these are fishermen they're used to this but this has to be scary just in and of itself how bad is this storm going to get we're out here in the very middle of the sea probably can't see land that way probably can't see land that way as you're going up and down those those waves fighting it fighting it they saw Jesus walking on the sea. Now, guys, when I was a kid, here's what I thought. When I was a kid, I pictured them sitting in a boat like this, and it was kind of rocking like this, but it was sitting still. And I pictured Jesus walking on the water towards them. Not what's going on. 
Somehow, Jesus got by the crowd. John doesn't tell us how. But we know, look, note takers, verse 22, chapter 6, verse 22. It tells us that a crowd stayed on that side of the lake. Don't, not, doesn't tell us how big it was, but a crowd stayed there. So somehow Jesus had snuck by the crowd, gone down to the sea, and started walking the eight miles. Jesus is going to walk eight miles across on the sea back to Capernaum. So when Jesus is walking on the water, it doesn't look like this. It it, it looks like this. He's walking on rough water. And here's these guys rowing. They're rowing. Up and down. Up and down. In the middle of the lake, you see a figure coming up by you like this. hope you have some extra underwear in that boat. And they were frightened. Guys, Mark tells us, Mark chapter 6, verse 48. Mark 6, 48. He tells us that Jesus wanted to pass by the boat because it was getting light. So it seems like that Jesus was wanting to get to Capernaum and get where he was needing to go under the cloak of darkness before people spotted him. That's what it seems like. Seems like Jesus was trying to beat them to the shore. But they come up, he comes up beside them near the boat and they're frightened, they're freaked out. But he said to them, well, I want you to hear Jesus say to you today, it is I, do not be afraid. If you'll turn to Jesus, if you'll let him in the boat, he'll get you where you're supposed to go. Stop trying to do it on your own. Stop trying to figure it all out on your own. Guys, right here in the story is where Matthew tells us about Peter walking on the water. Right here. Verse 21, then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately, everybody say immediately. Immediately, the boat was at the land to which they were going. Four miles like that. I believe another miracle happened right there. I do not believe, when I read the text, I do not believe they rode the rest, rode the rest of the way to the shore. Jesus gets in the boat and a miracle happens. Guys, time after time, I have seen God intervene in people's lives. I have seen God turn things around here. I've seen checks show up in the mail for me where I didn't know the next dime was coming from. I've seen miracle after miracle after miracle because there are unlimited possibilities when you believe in Jesus. Listen, if you won't be afraid, if you'll let Jesus speak to you, it is I, do not be afraid. He can get you where you need to go. He can get you where you need to go. pray against a spirit of fear in your life. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me, Heavenly Father? Thank you so much for this time together today. God, I just pray against a spirit of fear right now. I just come into agreement with everyone under the sound of my voice. Spirit of fear, you have no authority in us. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. I will not be afraid of the terror by night. So spirit of fear, we rise up against you. In Jesus' name, we take authority over you. We cast you down. Whatsoever things are bound on earth are bound in heaven. Whatsoever things are loosed on earth are loosed in heaven. In Jesus' name, cast you out. Will you agree with me? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. 
us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the beginning of a journey against a spirit of fear. Lord, let us walk in power and in love and in a sound mind. God, I pray for healing to take place in people's lives, God, where there has been pain that fear has caused. Healing, victory. God, I pray for those that are up against walls right now in their lives. I pray, God, for clever devices. I pray for third options. I pray, God, for the creative God of the universe to speak to our hearts and lives and give us ways around a wall, under a wall, over a wall, and through a wall. Let us see how you make a way where there seems to be no way. Now listen, if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, all you have to do is believe that when he died, he died with your sins. He took your sin. He took it to hell so that you wouldn't have to. He did it in your place. And then he rose victorious from the grave. And if you believe that this morning, then you can be a believer in Jesus. He can come into your heart and he'll be your Lord and he'll be your savior, all right? I'm gonna have us all pray a prayer together and you trust Jesus. Trust him in your heart. Trust him in your life as we pray this prayer. I want the whole church praying with me, repeating after me. I confess I am a sinner. I believe you died for me. So I give my life to you. Be my savior. Be my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life. Okay, let's celebrate the Lord. Come on, let's thank him for what he's done. Come on, guys, let's give him praise. Let's give him glory. Come on, let's just take a moment and worship the Lord today. God, we praise you. We give you honor. We give you glory. Yes, God, you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for all, all of your goodness to us, God. Thank you, Lord, for saving us, for redeeming us, for setting us free from the curse of sin and death. Thank you, God, for freedom from fear. Thank you, God. No more fear. No more fear. No more fear in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I love you guys. God bless you.